tell me what to do, Kevin. Uh, I caught that on video. Like, don't tell me what to do, Kevin. Because um, I told him don't be tapping your, your knuckles on the table because it sounds super loud. All right. Welcome back to the podcast. I am here with Mr. Kirkwood today, Sean, who is the director of training for Fieldcraft Revival. Um, I used to work for this guy, man. What an ass. What What a what a gift I gave you yeah, to, to yeah. work with me. It was like a present. Do you remember? Like- <laughs> so Sean ran sniper school and I got there. We got there at the same time. And so he was my boss. Pretty much invented sniper school. Pretty much. I mean. (laughs) (laughs) So we were there there working for about a year. And then um, the ranger wing that I was in in Ireland offered, asked me if I wanted to come to an international counter-terrorist sniper course in Ireland. And I was like, there's no way to let me go. So I I go to Sean. And Sean's like, hey, if you get an invitation, an official one, I'll I'll send you. So I got to go to Ireland for three weeks to my old unit. Um, Like 20 years after I left. And go to a sniper course and it was awesome thanks for that no problem, it no problem. I'm, I'm here to help, I'm here to help. <laughs> uh, it, yeah me and another guy went and i remember we we were driving and he he saw a gas station he was like oh my god gas is cheap here it's like f- it's not as expensive as he thought and it was like four bucks or something and i was yeah. like that's per liter <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah and yeah. it's euros um anyway you know gonna, what i saw this morning bringing that uh, mike rodriguez Remember uh-huh. Rod, yeah, yeah, yeah. He is the president and the CEO of the Global War on Terror, Mem- Terror Memorial really? that is getting built in Washington D.C. Oh my He's god! He's in charge of that whole wow that, that whatever organization. It's a nonprofit that's taking yeah. donations. I saw him on Fox News this morning with uh, Mission Barbecue. Really? Yeah. Okay. They gave him like a one point four million dollar check. Hey, to, he got messed up, man. Yeah. His, his TV. He's got that contact yeah. in. And, but oh, uh, I haven't talked to him in a few years. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. I saw him on TV, but yeah. he's. Uh, I guess the, it's like the World War II Memorial or Korean War Memorial, Vietnam wow. War. It's that level of, of memorial. Wow. For the global war on terror, and he's like the the president and CEO of it. Good so for him. He's, Google it. I just found out this morning it existed. So if, if mm. you're out there doing it, Google it and donate. He was that's uh, a good deal. Yeah. He was a uh, seven group guy. Yep. And then he worked at sniper school with us. Yeah. 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 That's cool. Um, we're going to talk about asking why. All right. Why? The, the, it's why, funny because we, we, we were talking about this and there's so much stuff out there, especially in the training world. And if you really step back and look at it, it makes no sense. Now, just, just now when I was uh, getting my stuff ready to come in here, I was thinking, you know, I, I grew up in, you know, as a kid, as a Catholic, right? Yeah. And asking why, like I remember going... Noah's Ark makes no sense. Why didn't the lions just eat the zebras? <laughs> what, where, they were in the Middle East. Where did they get giraffes? I don't think there's any giraffes. Like, this makes no sense. Yeah. So I was asking why from a very young age. And I didn't get Is that any when the good... rulers came out? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was an ass kicking right there. A little blind faith was, was yeah. what they wanted. But um, I, I think it comes to maturity later on in life when you look yeah. back at some of the stuff that we've done too. And you're just like, that made no sense. Yeah. Because you just, you're taking on faith that it's the right thing. But when you really look at it critically, it makes no sense. And it's just, that's the way it's always been done. So yeah. people just take it and run with it. Right? Yeah. Well, and, and that's, and that's the two things. That's one of the things that's always been bad about training is you walk into an environment, whether it's military, wherever you're training, whatever you're doing, I don't care what the subject is. It, like if you ask, well, why do we do that? Uh, the answer generally is, well, that's the way we've always done it. Mm-hmm. And it works. Now I'm not saying it doesn't work. Maybe I'm not saying you have to change everything. Mm. But if you ask the question of why, well, why do we do it that way? And it, good techniques will stand on their own. Yeah. You know, bad techniques will go away, or they'll be altered and fixed to to meet whatever the new requirement is for whatever you're doing. Uh, but it's a it's a personality flaw in a lot of trainers. I think is I'm the expert in this. I yeah. know this way. And uh, I want to continue to be the expert, so I'm not going to go out of my comfort zone and learn a new way. So I just keep regurgitating. Uh, and especially if it works for somebody, like if, well, this is the way I did it and it worked for me fine. Well, that's awesome. But that doesn't mean the environment hasn't changed. You know, the M1 Garand worked fine to win mm-hmm. World War II. Mm-hmm. We changed the rifle over the years for various reasons, good or bad. Maybe it was a good decision or a bad, but you can't always fall back on, well, that's the way we've always done it. Mm-hmm. Otherwise... The other thing I say is one day you're working in a museum and you yeah. don't even realize it. Yeah. You know, the, the uh, people also get very tied to what they learn in school, right? That's yeah. why me and you both were adamant when we were running sniper school is like everything we put out has to be a hundred percent 
Yeah. Like, it has to be the right answer as far as we know at that point, right? Um, because people will take that to the ground. I learned this in sniper school, and it is yeah. right because uh, anything you teach there, people will take it as it's gospel. gospel yeah. And, and uh, you know, it, for a long time, th things were thought at sniper school that weren't 100% true, but it was all they had at the time. There was some assumptions made because they didn't have ballistic calculators, and, and it, they just... That that's what they figured out through trial and error, I guess. But it yeah. wasn't always a hundred percent true, and I, I I think well, there was a lot of information gaps because yeah. we didn't have really the the average person didn't have the technology mm -hmm. to know the answer. But now, I mean, it's like an it's like an iPhone in your hand. You have the world in your hand, especially with ballistic calculators. So why mm -hmm. wouldn't you use that? Yeah. Now we still got resistance. I got a lot of resistance mm -hmm. on it, um, and uh, but it was the right thing to do. Yeah, you know. let's let's go back a little bit into the old nineties when you were in. Oh, yeah. uh, when, what year did you come in? Ninety two. Eighty seven. Eighty seven. You're, you're old, I'm, man. I'm ancient. Yeah. You my my old. first duty station was West Germany. Those nice. two countries back then. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. Um, eighty seven. I was in Lebanon. Yeah. In eighty seven. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you came in, that was your first duty station from basic. Yeah. Really. Yeah. That's right cool. Out, right out of basic. Did you do any yeah. travel? Did I what? Did you do any traveling? Minimal. I yeah. went to Spain. Any place that there was a bar and a party, I generally <laughs> tried to go. But I didn't go see any of the cool stuff you yeah, should have seen. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I, was, I landed Man. in Germany on my 18th birthday, and I could drink as much as I wanted to. And yeah. the rest is yeah. fuzzy history. So you joined at 17. I joined at 17. Mm -hmm. I actually quit high school and joined the Army. Had nice. Signed. It shows. My mom had to sign for me. I know. I know. So... <laughs> I signed up and went in, yeah. and then my first duty station was Germany. Um, yeah. And, and but yeah, it was it, it was a lot different philosophy back then because a lot of the training was built. Any training was generally built around either the Cold War, Russia's mm -hmm. going to go come across the fold of the gap and invade West Germany scenario, which was theoretical. Believe it or, or not, Vietnam, Sean, when I was Vietnam. when I was in uh, Germany yeah. in '98, it, we were still we were still fighting that war. We were still yeah. training for a Soviet invasion. Yeah, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. They were going to come across with armored divisions, and that's that's all that they. And that was a theoretical. It could have happened. Yeah, I, I guess that's an option to train for. But mm -hmm. and then the other side of that, like I said, was Vietnam. That yeah. that was the other. That was the other war that we were kind of focusing on, and all the, you know, brigade and commanders and you know generals of that time were Vietnam. They were all had been in Vietnam generally. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. maybe as a platoon leader, company commander, whatever. Mm. Um, so a lot of the institutional knowledge and training methodology was built around that. I remember one. I remember one. The first why that I remember ever really having is we were in a mechanized infantry unit, right? So I'm in this big metal box and M113 personnel carrier, right? And I'm in the squad in the back, got my weapon. So bullet magnet. Yeah, we were in the field in the winter time, cold as hell, and we were gonna have hot chow brought to us one day, which is like an awesome treat, right? So they loaded up a bunch of mermite, big thermos containers full of hot chow, and they set it up in this wood somewhere. So we pull up, and we, we're all tactical, and we're all camouflaged, and we tactically get out of our vehicles. And then we had what was called tactical chow. Mm -hmm. So we had to we had to stay, you know, 10, 10 yards apart going through the, the chow line. And mm -hmm. I remember going through the chow, and when we weren't in a chow line, like actively getting food on plates, we had to take a knee and like face out. Yeah. Like the enemy mm -hmm. was all around. And I remember going, getting my food, happy to get my food, but thinking, why are we doing this? If, if the enemy threat is so high, why are they bringing us hot chow? <laughs> Shouldn't we be in a defensive <laughs> position or patrolling to go kill these guys that are going to yeah. kill us while I'm getting my chili mac? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it was just, yeah. it was like you didn't really ask. It was like, okay, this is tactical chow. This is what you got to yeah. do. And I just, yeah, yeah. It's a dangerous situation if I got to face out and pull security in between the chili mac and the green bean station. <laughs> <laughs> You get shot by a sniper when you're getting your cornbread, man. Yeah, I'm like, what is this? Uh, yeah, was... the, you probably did a lot of NBC stuff back oh, then. Tons. Yeah, tons. we even that did was, it Yeah, in the 90s. And that, again, that was very check the box, oh, right? Yeah. And oh, it yeah. was very, um, like you went through all the, the pieces, but when you look back, it didn't make a lot of sense, really. Yeah. Like, yeah. Um, if it was quiet enough, you could hear your company commander checking the block. Yeah, you could. You could, could. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you, you know, you have like three seconds to put your mask on yeah. and seal it, right? Yeah. Oh my God, that's a bad one, right? And then uh, decontamination, oh, like yeah. complete check the box, oh, yeah. right? We were um, the, the charcoal NBC suits that yeah. we had that you just die in, yeah. right? Hyper, or, or, um, the good thing about that awesome. in West Germany during the winter was they were warm. So yeah. whoever did it there was like awesome. Let's put on our mob suits. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, the, uh, 
but it, you don't get anywhere as a private asking why they don't no. like that and i did ask why a lot because i would experience private didn't yeah. make any they didn't like that at all yeah. you know i had an e7 platoon sergeant like crush me one time in an aar because i said something and i i don't know if i ever told you this and i pulled him aside i was uh pfc i think and i pulled him aside afterwards and i was like what the hell is your problem like i probably shouldn't talk to an e7 yeah. like that and he said i, I can't have you stealing my thunder that's what he yeah, said. That is a bad Talk thing. about an insecure yeah. E7. Yeah. When I, when I, uh, you can't be smarter than uh, me. Yeah. We were in Kuwait as well, and my platoon leader, who was a jackass, he was. We were walking across the desert, and he had a plugger, you know, GPS, yeah. and he had the light on the whole time. You could see it for miles. And I busted him in the AAR, and he pulled me aside, and he said, "I don't appreciate you busting me out like that." And I said, "Hey, everybody's here to learn. That's yeah. the point, yeah. right?" It's not a group hug. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so what else? In in the early days, there were probably a lot of that. Yeah, check there, the box. There like, was lots yeah, of that. Check yeah. the box. Like even even the the normal training you did. Like like let's just go back to uh, rifle qualification. Mm -hmm. That's such a check the block thing. Oh yeah, sitting know? in a foxhole. Sitting in a foxhole. Mm -hmm. You know the a perfect foxhole sandbag positions. Yeah. You know or just you know where the targets are going to come up. I mean, just the qualification itself was kind of mm -hmm. was was. There's no really why behind it. Why are we doing this? Well, mm. what's the point of all that? Um, it has evolved slightly. Yeah. Now to get behind cover and they yeah. shoot from an E and they shoot standing, but that only recently changed. I think yeah. that foxhole was going on until recently. Yeah. Um, and it was just to check the box, right? It was just okay. You're in this defensive position and you're going to shoot these pop up targets out to 300, yeah. and you don't have to hit anything at 300. You can hit one and two, and uh, move on, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. What else? Yeah, there was just a lot, a lot of uh, institutional stuff that that came out that you know once the once the war started, we yeah. just realized was 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 garbage. And you know, in the eighties again, it's the lessons learned were sporadic. Like yeah. even the combat, like you know, Grenada and and things that happened in the eighties were were a little you know uh, were like lightning strikes. Mm -hmm. You know, and the and the people that were involved in that learned a lot of lessons that were in combat, but. Um, I think a lot of it never really got disseminated, mm. or if it did, there was just it, it was just well, that's that's a one off. You know, that just we're happened. Bad. Time. We I, like the military. We're bad at harnessing lessons learned. Oh yeah, and and the, all the lessons learned in Iraq, Afghanistan, a lot of them are going to get relearned in the next war. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it just that's the way it is. The um, what about the, the the Q course? What were they teaching on the Q course? Because I've got a couple on the Q oh. course. Like we were still doing the polls. With the string, with the oh, thirty-five millimeter camera uh, hanging, and the and plane flies over plane and with scoops the boat anchor it up. And scoop yeah, it up. The, uh, what would they call it? The MPU uh, was message. It, I pickup. can't remember. I remember that message yeah. pickup thing. Yeah, that, yeah. that was like a an, an old Vietnam. It was and yeah. before. Yeah, like you couldn't land an airplane, so they'd fly by with a boat yeah. anchor and get a yeah get a message out. Yeah, and we're, we're sitting there with satellite radios. Yeah. I mean, I know it wasn't that long ago. Yeah, you know, yeah. Uh, there's some of those old school things are cool because especially as a Green Beret, you're t training in Dig who don't yeah. have all your technology, right? So some of that stuff you have to maintain yeah. in order to to team up. But people are very reluctant to to modernize too, right? Yeah. Like Morse code only went out a few years ago, I think, yeah. in the Q yeah, course because didn't... they're like, look, we need to train computers and networking and all this other, you know, satellite communications, and we just don't have room for everything. Yeah, you and, have I, and to, I think mm -hmm. I can hear there's an argument to be made for you know, yeah, you don't want to get rid of everything, like just because it's an an older technique or a technique that. Um, you don't use often does not necessarily mean that it's a technique you don't need to have in your tool bag mm -hmm. but uh there's just people that get tied to it and they refuse to like it's mm -hmm. you know if, if you don't have if you're not able to have an aircraft pick up a message with a boat anchor flying from it you're you're gonna die yeah and yeah. that mentality is just what's what's bad in the whole training world is like if you don't do this thing mm -hmm. um whatever it is it, everything you do is garbage yeah and uh, it's just not it's just not true I it's mean, very very visible now uh, yeah. that we are in as much as we hate it we're in the tactical space a little bit and we're in the social media space and you'll get a lot of guys who teach a certain skill set usually it's firearms and they try to make it theirs right they try yeah. to find this little niche thing and they talk like if you don't do it exactly like this you'll never hit a target again in your nope, life never. right and anybody who speaks and says something different just gets attacked yeah, because yeah. you got to shut people up, right? Yeah. Um, well, and that's the thing. It's like I have a, you know, I'm an opinionated guy. So are you. Mm -hmm. I would never, ever. I'm not. Except <laughs> for you. You used to be. You went to therapy. But I am. Okay, I'm really opinionated. But I would never go out there and 
and out in a public space and just like go after somebody no. about that technique is garbage mm -hmm. and this and that and some yeah. of the comments you read and, and the, it's just like come on man yeah i you feel know, get, sorry get for the moment you man. know yeah even if i disagree with you yeah. i mean there's a lot that i disagree with people that are doing out there but everybody's doing their own version of it you mm -hmm. got to decide for your own mm -hmm. and i would never go out and attack somebody for what they're teaching even if it's completely like opposite of what i think yeah i'd yeah. be like you know, yeah. all right, man, mm -hmm. get out there and do it. Cause there's a lot, there's a lot of techniques with everything, mm -hmm. you know, and everybody has a different experience and a different outlook on things. And it's really hard to define, well, this is the only way you can do it. I was watching like a world war two video the other day about handgun training, just mm -hmm. you know, watching it just to kind of see like one of them old, Hey, today we're yeah, preaching yeah. a 45 caliber, yeah. that old, old yeah. timey, like war department video. And I'm watching some of the techniques on there, and some of them I was like, "Ooh, yeah, they're yeah. going to do that." But I'm like, "These guys won World War II. They did." Yeah. You know? yeah. I mean, I'm not saying it was perfect what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's better ways, and I, there are better ways. And I would never do a lot of those techniques. But am I going to go out and bash that guy for teaching it now and go, yeah. "Oh, that dude don't know what he's talking about"? Yeah. Well, the tactical space you know? is so toxic because there's tons and tons and tons of ca tactical companies, and they're all fighting for scraps, right? Yeah. They're all trying to get that customer. Yeah. So they find it hard to elevate themselves above the yeah. crowd, so they try to pull people down. Yeah. And I think it's actually a good template. If you're looking for a company to train with, yeah. look at, and, and I mean, we're not everywhere, right? But if you look at a company and look at their social media and look at how they talk about other companies and yeah. how they bash other companies, yeah. and if they'll do that, they'll bash you behind your back yeah. for being a yeah. screwed up student or yeah. they'll talk trash or it's just a toxic environment. I think it's a good template for you to vet a company. Yeah. Look at the look at what they how they treat other companies. And yeah. um, it, it's probably a good way. Well, it's like when we were in doing force mod stuff before, it was like one of the biggest things that would make me flip a switch on a company is like, if you come into me telling me how bad all the other companies are and your yeah. widget is better than their widget mm -hmm. or their widget is bad. And yeah, I don't want to hear about that. I want to mm -hmm. hear how good your stuff is. Yeah. And if it is awesome, I'll be the judge of that. But I, as soon as you start bashing another company, yeah. it's just, I, I don't really want to hear it. Put you in a bad light. Put you in a bad light. Winners focus on the, on the finish line, not yeah. everybody else. Right. Um, when we when we got to uh, sniper school together, yeah, and we started looking at because we both came out of the war, yeah, multiple tours to to combat. We were both snipers in the SIF company. You were in fifth, I was in third. Multiple trips to the ICTF, the Iraqi Counter Terrorist Force. A lot of combat time, right? Um, and we got to sniper school in two thousand eight. Now, almost every mission we did in Iraq was at night. Because yeah. we were on reverse cycle. We slept yeah. during the day and we, we, we were going after bad guys in their bed down location. Yeah. Right? But when we both got there, there was like one night shoot. Yeah. Right? And it was garbage. And it was just check the box. It was like a familiarization. Yes. Fire. It was stupid. There was no right? training involved. No, it was bad. Yeah. So there was, the course had gotten kind of stagnant, I yeah. think. It was and the it same course I went to yeah. 10 years prior, mm -hmm. 12 years prior. And it, nothing had changed. The first couple of days was shooting iron sights. With the uh, the palmacites and the M twenty four, with the what do you call that sling? The oh, one you put on your arm yeah, that, and you wrap yeah, it you around wrap yourself up, and, and they even had they even had the the, the oven mitts, the oven and, mitts, and, yeah, uh, yeah, and and you you lock that sling in and yeah. you can't move, yeah, and three days of shooting iron sights, and we talked about getting people on an optic earlier, and we, yeah. we it wasn't a frivolous, you know, made in in a, in yeah. a it quickly made the decision. We actually talked a lot. We talked to yeah. Todd Hodnett about it. And yeah. Because just because nobody else did it doesn't mean it was wrong. Yeah. And I was trying to understand the training methodology. But like you said earlier, nobody could explain the why no. to us. Like the guys I, who'd worked there for years, they couldn't explain the why. Well, what really got me on that one specifically was, you know, okay, we're teaching people. The idea was you got to teach them basic, mm -hmm. basic marksmanship skills, all that stuff. I agree with that. But as soon as we were done doing those basic marksmanship skills with position and everything like that with those iron sights, your whole body position and the way you shot that rifle changed as soon as you put an optic on it. Yeah. Your, mm -hmm. Everything changed. And I was like, why are we teaching them this way and then immediately changing everything? Because shooting an iron sight is not exactly the same as shooting the scope. Where your mm -hmm. face is, where, you know, the, how your body aligns. Eye relief. Everything, eye relief, everything. Eye relief, yeah. everything mm -hmm. changes. So we're basically spending a week of wasted time mm -hmm. and really you know what that week got us when we got rid of that we added gas guns yeah because before we weren't shooting gas guns yeah. they were only shooting bolt guns because mm -hmm. you know snipers didn't shoot gas yeah. guns yeah and uh which 
that's an old methodology. Why aren't we shooting gas guns? They're not as accurate. Yeah. Yes, they are. I remember you. Uh, you know, they were then. Yeah. yeah they started yeah. getting as accurate. Yeah. yeah. I well, remember I, you. You. You were the guest speaker at the sniper comp. Yeah. And you were saying that. Uh, you know, you lessons learned in combat and yeah. that, and you're like yeah. running down the street in Baghdad trying to reload a bolt gun with an internal magazine. Yeah. Not great. Not a good Not idea. A good yeah. idea. It's the yeah. wrong, wrong weapon to have in your yeah. hand during a, during yeah. a gunfight. Yeah. You know, but there was just, there was a lot of things that nobody ever asked why. They were like, I'm going to go to the schoolhouse and, you know, I'm going to touch the magic and then when I go back to my unit. But what I realized is I had went to school before the war. Mm-hmm. When I went to combat and I, and I infilled as a sniper my first time, I realized that I didn't know anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, I realized that I knew how to zero my gun and basically slip the scales and call a little bit of wind. That was about it. Mm. I didn't know how to do hides. I didn't know how to you know move the right way. I didn't, I didn't know more. I knew less than I thought I knew. And I just, I, luckily, I survived a couple close calls because of that knowledge gap. So when I got to the course mm-hmm. and started and, and took it over, I was like, that's, that stuff's changing now because mm-hmm. we were in the middle of the war mm-hmm. and I had a good chain of command. And I just, again, I didn't go in there like a, a bull in the China shop. I kind of went in there and I started asking, well, explain this to me. You remember I had all the instructors pitch me their classes mm-hmm. that they had. And then we started asking, well, why are we doing this? Mm-hmm. Why are we doing that? And then a lot of them just, they couldn't explain it. Now no. if they could explain it and it made sense to me. Like I remember one specifically, I was like, uh, why are we still doing stocks? Because I remember being on the on the side of I want to get rid of stocks mm-hmm. because these guys aren't doing mm-hmm. the, you know, moving, crawling on the ground, and, and, you know, doing. A, I'm not saying it's not a sniper skill that they would need, but at the time, I thought we should get rid of them. Now in hindsight, I realized that I was I, that was a bad opinion on my part. I thought I think I was wrong on that one, and I forget who the instructor that told me about that was, but they said, hey, look, basically a stock is a consolidation of movement, camo, and concealment. Selecting a firing position, IDing a target. There's a lot of different tasks that are involved with that. So that's why I think we should keep stocks. And I was mm-hmm. like, that's a good point. Yeah. I was taking it too literal. I was going like, because I had just come out of combat. Mm-hmm. Like, well, I never saw that in combat. I was kind of making the same mistake that a lot of guys make yeah. that got into my position. Mm-hmm. And I, I kind of a light bulb went on my head at that point. I was like, you know, that's a good reason why we're doing that. It's a consolidation of tasks. Mm-hmm. Now, if they do that actually in combat or not, it doesn't really matter. We're, we're, uh, observing a lot of different tasks in one package that we can decide if that person knows them or not. So mm-hmm. we kept stocks yep. think, and, and they stayed. Yep. Um, but not everything could be answered like that. Mm-hmm. Why weren't we shooting past 800 meters was another question I asked. Yeah. We were only shooting out to 800 yards. And uh, we had the range. Mm-hmm. And what I was told when I asked the why from one of the senior instructors was it's beyond the capability of the firearm. Yeah. Now, I had just come from Todd Hodden's place where we were doing mile shots mm-hmm. with... 1,680 mm-hmm. yards with 308s. Yeah. Now, is that a shot I'd want to take with a 308? No. But it still has, it's still shooting as fast or running as fast as a 45 out of the barrel at mm-hmm. 680 yards. So I could kill somebody at that range. No, I don't want to ever take that shot. It's too long of a shot, but it's way farther than 800. So what do we do? We started training eight, We started training past 800. And mm-hmm. really, we only stopped because of uh, range restrictions. We could only get out to uh, maybe 1,200. Mm-hmm. I don't remember what our. Thousand or thousand on sixty seven. We could go to a thousand. Yeah. Yeah. So um, so we pushed out as far as we mm-hmm. could go. And the three hundred wind mags were coming on board at that point. Yeah. And then we got ballistic calculators and and better night vision and um, the night thing too. We we started hammering yeah. night training, night training, night training. Um, movers. Uh, yeah. A lot movers. More. Yeah. Once and even th- even the uh, the uh, the stress shoots that we put in. Yeah. Running and gunning, moving mm-hmm. from position to position. Now that's what assaulters do. Well, no. No. I've been running through the streets yeah. in Sauter City where yeah. I had to run for my life and be in a gunfight. Mm-hmm. No, this is snipers have to do it too. Yep. Yep. You know? Um the uh what other schools did you go to that you had to change the mindset on? I know you worked the captain's career course and stuff like that. Um you mean as far as an instructor? Yeah, as far as an instructor or a guy the guy in charge or even one of the instructors that looked at stuff and go, this doesn't make sense to me. Yeah, I would say the uh Sear school when I worked there and again, I'm, I'm I can't speak 100 percent on it uh, on one subject, but I had an opinion on. So Sear is survival, survival, escape, resistance, and evasion, mm-hmm. or survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. I say it both ways. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But you know, I my opinion was I I mostly did the uh, the part where you're captured, like yeah. how to resist interrogation mm-hmm. and what to do, what not to do. That that was my section of the training. Um, and what I noticed immediately was we were we were training. There's three different spectrums of captivity that you can be in, and one of them is wartime. Well, the least likely one for that 
over the last 30 years that Americans have been involved in is wartime prisoner of war. Mm-hmm. But our whole scenario was built around the least likely scenario. Yeah, when you, when you talk about wartime, you talk about a conventional army yeah, war, two, not World Afghanistan war or Iraq. War. World yes. War II type mm-hmm. war. And uh, we haven't been in any of that since World War II. Mm. And they actually did a 30-year study of... Um, you know, the types of captivity over 30 years. Mm. And there's, I forget the numbers, but basically it was like 92% of them were either uh, hostage detention or peacetime governmental detention. So peacetime governmental detention is a country that we're not at war with yeah. is holding me it's for like some reason. like the guys reason. who got rolled up in Kosovo. Yes. That thing. Yeah, yeah. That's peacetime mm-hmm. governmental detention. And, and honestly, even if you were captured in Iraq, Technically, by the definition, that's peacetime governmental detention because mm. we never declared war against Iraq or mm. Afghanistan through mm. Congress. But even if you take those out of the out of the picture, it's still 92% of the things. So I look at stats and say, when I was there, my argument was, by regulation, we had to train two of those three spectrums. I was like, why are we, then we should dump wartime. Mm. We should only train peacetime governmental and it, hostage detention because those are the most likely. Are they, are, can you... If you got trained on those two, yeah. could you revert to wartime? Is, yes. it, is it that different? It, it's, there's, you know, and all this is, you know, is classified techniques, but yes, the answer is yes. Um, can you te- go the other way? If you train wartime, can you do the peacetime stuff? Is it harder? It, it is harder. Yeah, I'd imagine it, it is. It is harder yeah. because there's, there, it's, it's about constraints. You know, yeah. honestly, it, and really this is about uh, the law land warfare and the Geneva Convention and all that, which not a lot of people follow mm-hmm. it anyways other than us. But if they did follow by the rules and we were playing by the rules and you were in a wartime detention, you have, that's the easiest, that's the easiest of all three. Yeah. Be- well, it, the, the most dangerous part i assume and this is i went to that school a long time ago is getting rolled up on the battlefield by frontline troops but once you get processed and move backwards yes. your, yep. your survivability rate is very high it, right yeah it increases but with, with the with the peacetime detention or especially with the hostage stuff you're almost you're always in that yep. very dangerous yeah. phase hostage is the most dangerous and the most likely yeah for yeah. for anybody mm-hmm. i mean because if you're a military because hostage is one of the things that'll happen when you're on leave as, yeah. a, as a service or could happen mm-hmm. or you're deployed to you know kosovo or yeah. you're in uh doing something in syria i mean that we're not at war with a lot of the, most of the missions we're on especially special operations you're not in an active war mm. that you know we've what declared. was the argument against that that's the way we've all, it really boiled down really? to you mm. know la 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 fingers in my ears and that's the way we've always done it and we'll look at all the work we've done over it almost became like uh the the last exercise, which, and again, I don't want to be taken wrong. It's a great exercise. Mm-hmm. It's a great scenario-based training event. Awesome. Great. Um, but it almost became a rite of passage mm. more than adjusting oh. to what the force needs. Okay. You know, it's like, well, this is the way we've always done it. It's awesome. Because everybody has their awesome experience in SEER. Mm-hmm. And you have it. I have it when, you know, the, the whole, the way it all goes, it's like, it's this memory you have, right? Mm-hmm. Um but it almost became like the Darby Queen in Ranger School. It's it's an obstacle course, mm-hmm. but everybody remembers going through it. It's it's a rite of passage kind of thing. Are we necessarily training our force actively to be the best they can be in that situation? Yeah, I would argue no. Yeah. I th- I would argue that we're not, we are training them well, but we could train them better. Was yeah. my argument. Not yeah. that what we we're doing is garbage because it wasn't. It's a good. It's mm-hmm. a great course. But I I think you got to look at it critically and yeah. go. I know it's a little out of your comfort zone, but why are why exactly are explain to me why when yeah. If I have 10 incidents and nine of them are one and one of them is the other, why are we focused on the one? Why aren't we focused on the nine? Yeah, to get and, the best and, product. Yeah. And I even had, you know, data. And, yeah. I, and it was just, it was an organizational uh, lack of will to make that kind of change. The the, the way SWIC, which is Special Welfare Training Group, I, I'm hoping to get the SWIC CSM in here in January and talk to him, but the way SWIC operates is it has... Uh, uniformed Green Beret instructors who've yeah. been on the team for a couple of years. And it also has civilians that are prior special operations that work there. Yeah. And, and it, that's can, what it I did. can be that's a, true. it can be a great thing because it gives you that very experienced guy and they stayed there for years and their GS and their continuity, right? From course to course to course. Yeah. But it can also be a double-edged sword where you get the guy who's like that, where it's like, this is the way we have always done it. Yep. And this is what I'm comfortable with. And I don't want to change anything. Yeah, right? exactly. Yeah. It, so, well, it's, it's typical government. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, you know, I was there, there's a, there's a percentage of uh, civilian GS government or uh, general service instructors that are hired by the army that are awesome dudes. Mm-hmm. Great 
head on, doing the right thing, pushing hard. But there's a large percentage it's not. There's yeah. a large percentage. It's impossible it, to fire. Impossible. Yes. Yeah, good impossible. luck. Impossible. I mean, yeah. and, uh, and it's really hard to... Uh, to make change when a lot of them, a lot of people just have the idea, well, I'll just wait them out. I'll just wait this chain mm -hmm. of command out because I know you're here for two years. I've been here 15 already. I'll wait. I'll wait you out two years and slow roll. You can't really fire me. And then when you leave, I'll convince the new guy that I yeah. really know what's taught and what, what I'm doing and you don't. And it happens and all the time. All the time. All the constantly. time. Yep. And again, you know, I, I, I had a, I had good experiences as a, as a GS employee. I, I enjoyed what I was doing. I had great jobs. Um, and that's not why, honestly, that's not why I left. I, I you know, I decided to come on the field craft. Mm -hmm. I just, uh, I did notice that though. And, and I think as soon as you back to the training thing, as soon as you stop asking yourself, why am I doing this way? I don't care what you've been doing. I always say to people, name me one thing you do the same now that you did 20 years ago. Mm -hmm. One thing I guarantee most people in our life don't have one, don't have anything in our lives. They do the same. Mm -hmm. You don't have the same iPhone. You don't have the same workout routine you don't eat the same foods you don't go to the same restaurants mm -hmm. you don't drive the same car you know th there's a lot of things you don't do that you did 20 mm -hmm. years ago it's not because what you did 20 years ago was garbage it was just because you've evolved over the, time the flip side because there's pros and cons to everything the yeah. flip side of that is just changing stuff for the yeah. sake of changing and exactly. that happens a lot too oh yeah. oh yeah where guys come in and they're like you know i i, I laugh but i i say like uh that the officers and ncos and swick right nobody gets a bullet an excellent bullet on their evaluation report that says kept everything the same because it was working yeah. right so yeah. they change things just for the sake of changing them and then the next guy comes in and changes them back the way they were before yeah um it's insane well but i had a call from one of my one of the guys i used to work with he was in a15 long after i was gone mm -hmm. i didn't know him in a15 but i met him when i was a civilian working up at range 37 well he's a, a team sergeant now in, in a15 you know and i uh, He's a big history guy with the with the SIF CRIF companies, and mm -hmm. he knows all all the ins and outs. Just a smart guy, and he's into it, right? And we we have a good relationship. And he called me. He's like, and I was telling my guys to, about you know the black rifle video of you, and and they were in the same company I was in, and and uh, they they watched it. And I was like, I didn't even know that happened with this company, mm -hmm. you know. And I was like, you know, one day one day you're the tip of the spear, and the next day you're a dusty picture on the wall. <laughs> it's just the way it is. Yeah, and, and, it is. Yeah. But you know, but the reason I bring that up is because. You know, they're coming here to do some training. He wants me to come by and do like a little talk with them, just talk mm -hmm. to them. And uh, um, really what it's about is, is just you lose that institutional knowledge and, and you lose the why behind things. And, and if your experience is all peacetime, which mine was coming up, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I grew up in the peacetime army. And if that's all you know, training is going to change. And it's not always going to change to the right way. It might trade change into range isms you know mm -hmm. that, that we talk about all the time mm -hmm. and and it ebbs and flows based on a level of experience that's that's going on yeah I, I was telling you yesterday that when i was in um, germany we had a you know a lot of it's based on the leadership you have right yeah. from the battalion commander down but we had a crap sergeant major and we were out training on the range and we were breaking contact and doing all kinds of things and then he came out and like down range is down range in front of you and we are shooting. But when we ran backwards, we had to turn the gun, keep it pointed up and down range over your right shoulder yeah. and run back with the gun. Like it was ridiculous. You didn't do that like in combat? I, I did not do oh, that in well, combat. You no. Safe, so um <laughs> no, it was insane. And that that gets trained and hammered into people. Yeah. And they, they, they go to combat and they're not ready. Well, and and, that's what yeah. they'll do. That's mm -hmm. what they'll do. And we talked about another one like in, in uh, our CQB school. Like we would go and we would clear our corner and you'd get into the corner and you'd you'd move your weapon yeah. left and right mm -hmm. on each either edge of your sector of fire, the left mm -hmm. and right limits of your sector of fire. Now, in a real world, I do that with my eyes, mm -hmm. and I look. Now, why did I do that in school? Because there's people on the catwalk, yep. and they want to see me. I call it the sprinkler. They wanted to see me move my rifle one meter from the guy in the corner opposite of me and move my rifle all the way back to my secondary sector of fire again, mm -hmm. and then I was good, and I checked the block. So Cooperate and graduate. Exactly. Yeah. But that tra And I understand why the instructors did it. I'm not even. I'm not throwing rocks. I'm yeah. just saying that was a training-ism. Mm -hmm. um, rooms with no furniture in them. Yep. I mean, how many rooms did we clear that were empty? Very, yeah, very, none. very few, none. <laughs> yeah. You know, I cleared um, a room one time in Afghanistan, and it was a big uh, structure, like a big kind of warehouse. Yeah. We're, we're clearing this whole village, and we were shotgunning all the doors and all that. And we shotgunned this door, and we kicked it in, and we hauled ass in there. 
and the whole village was using that to take a dump in. And because there was there was like pieces missing from the back of the building, oh and they're all climbing in there and crapping on the floor. So the whole right. floor was covered in human feces. And we breached and entered dynamically and stopped dead in our tracks. Yeah. Somebody could have been shooting, and I wasn't taking oh, another no, no, step. No, no. no. It was a no. yeah, yeah. Ew, <laughs> nasty. Yeah. Sorry, that just flashed into my brain. Yeah. Um, but it's just it's these rangeisms and these. Uh, nobody asked a why. Why are we doing that? And I remember uh, one of the guys that when I was a team sergeant made a big change to the way we, this is back in 06 or 07, mm -hmm. probably 06, um, made a change based on combat. Jack Nevels, who came from your mm -hmm. your uh, your company, B23, mm -hmm. he came there and took over the CQB course, and he was like, this is not the way we do it. So we're going to... Yeah. We're going to institute dynamic CQB, which caused a lot of drama. And mm -hmm. but long story short, that was how we were doing it downrange. Yeah. And so he put it in the course. So a lot of that went away. Well, now fast forward a few years, they're back to they're back to the other ways. Yeah. That yeah. Way. Now, again, everybody, I firmly believe everybody's trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. They're doing what they think is right. And but I think there's a lot. It's the path of least resistance just to go to those. Why are we not ask? Why are we doing this? Jack Neville ran. He ran Sephardic when I went through. Yeah, and when we did combatives, we did taking people down and flex cuffing them. Right, yeah. and his point was, look, and he's a combatives guy. He's yeah, a Brazilian he jiu-jitsu guy. He's like, look. If I'm arm barring you in the house, if you yeah. touch me in the house, you're yeah. a combatant, you're getting shot, yeah. right? And if I don't shoot you, somebody else will. Yeah. I'm not wrestling on the yeah. freaking ground with you. I, I, you know, I, I and will... again, a good point to that is like, look, that was our specific section of the world, what, mm. what we were doing. Now, if, if I was a law enforcement officer nowadays, yeah. 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 and I would be mm -hmm. a black belt in Brazilian yeah, Jiu-Jitsu because you, know? you have, to, you have yeah. to be able to do that all the time. Yeah. In our world, you're right. Somebody starts wrestling with you, it's not mm -hmm. a wrestling match, it's a gunfight, yeah. and everything changes. Changes, but law enforcement can't do that. So again, I'm not saying doing combatives is wrong or it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's not. It's great. It's awesome. Brazilian Jiu Jitsu was great. Mm -hmm. It just it doesn't fit into every everything. Yeah, you know you don't want. And again, even if you train it, you got to look at if I have 50 tasks to train, you have to prioritize. Mm -hmm. You have to decide what's important. Yeah. Like if I'm a special forces guy or a special operator going into a structures. How, what, if I have a rifle and pistol, what should I train with more? I should probably train with my rifle because that's what I got in my hands all mm -hmm. the time. My pistol's a reserve parachute. Now, if I'm a cop, it's the opposite. Yeah. I'm always going to have my pistol, and i got to go to my rifle, so that's probably going to be a secondary. Mm. But people don't do that analysis. It'd be like if I went to a police station, I, I became the chief of police somewhere, and said, hey, all this pistol work you guys aren't doing it anymore. We're doing all rifle. Mm. And all I carry is a pistol. That's dumb. Yeah. So, again, you you got to really ask why. You gotta ask, why am I doing this? Uh, is this is this the best technique I could teach it with? If mm. if the answer is it because it's a great thing that I need to know, a great task, okay, am I training it the best way that I can? Am I using all available information to train this the best way for what my situation? Mm. Um, and then if if you are good, it stands on its own. Doesn't even need to have any more discussion. If you'd no background in this in this world and you were a civilian looking to get better prepared, and you look at all the courses we run, what would you do first? All the courses we run, mm -hmm. um, first thing I would do is personal security. Yeah, that's a good one to start because with. Because it's yeah. mindset. Mm -hmm. it, it's it's situational awareness. It's it's using mm -hmm. your using what's between your ears first. Yeah. And to think through problems. That would yeah. be the first one that I would I would probably Yeah. I would that probably that or medical through. training. If you don't have any yeah. medical training, you need to get some med training. Yeah. That, med that's... Medical training, situational awareness, and then you know, and then I'd get into I would start at, you know, like we have basic, you know, our, our course names basically changed mm -hmm. in 2023. They're changing. So now we have a basic pistol and carbine. And that's obviously where I'd start at step one because it's basic. It's foundational. It's it's building a foundation. And what I've, what I've noticed about the basics over the years is, you know, everybody wants to be outside the box. Mm. You know, that's a term you hear. I want to think outside the box. It's like you have to box. be conventional before you can be unconventional. Yeah, exactly. Right? Yeah. Well, what I want you to be able to do is define the define the four corners of the box first and then try to get outside of them. And a lot of people, to include well-trained, special, a lot of people in a lot of different aspects, they want to jump right to advanced. And I, I guarantee you, I don't care what your level of shooting is, we'll just use shooting as an example. If you go to a basic course and slow it down and refocus on the basics, you're going to be, it's going to be value added for you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, basic pistol, basic carbine, and then we go to defensive pistol and defensive carbine. And all that is, is it's stepping it up a little bit. You know, because you're in a maybe home defense, or you have a little bit of basic skills that you want to expand on, and then we go to performance, which is pushing the envelope even more. Put, 
outrunning your headlights a little bit and bringing it back. Mm. You know, so if you do those in sequence and, and build that plan for yourself, that's going to be good. I mean, that, that'll get you well trained in next year. But really, like we said, mindset, medical training is always a priority mm-hmm. because if you ever get into it, if there's ever guns out and people are shooting at each other, somebody's going to have a hole in them. Mm. Um, so you better get some medical training. But also medical training applies to normal life, car wrecks. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I was coming home from work one day and a, and a car flipped over on the side of the road, ran right off the road, ran into a tree and flipped over on the side of the road. I didn't need my firearm, but medical kit mm-hmm. sure helps. And, yeah. and a lot of people are in those situations every day. Yeah, we, we talked about the uh, the name change for the firearm stuff. And, and what it does, it puts people of, hopefully it puts people of the same skill set in the course together, yeah. right? So instructors can focus on pacing that course yeah. to the right speed, right? And and, and for, for basic defensive and, and dynamic uh, pistol and carbine, right? So you're in with Performance. people. Basic defensive and performance uh, performance okay i'm sorry <laughs> um so um people can can weigh where they want to get in and i'll be honest yeah. if you did those three yeah then at that point you're you're buying ammo and running drills you yeah. know what i mean and and yeah. you're pretty good at the end of those three because we got phenomenal yeah. instructors but yeah. if you don't just, if you just maintain those skills yeah I mean, you're you know honestly there's a lot of people that shoot all the time but i would say that the biggest segment of the society they don't shoot as much as they want to for various reasons, time, yeah. ammo, motivation, whatever it is. But you can be proficient and gain the skills and then and then keep them up. Maintain. It's like going to the gym and maintaining. You don't just go to the gym and do random stuff. you mm. you got a plan. you, you got, got a plan shoot. for yeah. your personal fitness. So if you've got a training plan for firearms, have a plan. Go to the If you go to the range once a month and you shoot 50 rounds, but you have purpose behind those rounds, you're yeah. better prepared than if you just go blast 200 rounds with no plan. I've seen that a lot. People just yeah. go and burn powder and shoot, 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 shoot. But yeah. they're, not, they're not shooting drills. They're not isolating um, certain training goals. Yeah. And it's it's not wasted, but you're not getting the full benefit from what you're no. doing. Yeah, no, not you're not. And, yeah. and, and that's really what you got to look at when you do that. You know, and what we talked about is the why. We're back to the why thing. Yeah. Why you do something. Remember back in the 90s? Well, all the way for a long time. What did our med kit consist of back in the 90s? That it tourniquet was, and that, oh field there, dressing. There's yeah. one little yeah. three by five field dressing that and it was a cravat. It was a cravat. Yeah. And that yeah. was it. Yeah. And and any mm-hmm. anybody that's ever seen or been around a wound in combat knows that that is nowhere near enough mm-hmm. for almost any wound no. that you're gonna see in a gunfight or any yeah. kind of trauma. But we carried it for years. Mm-hmm. And that was that was what our but and nobody ever asked, well, why do we carry this? How much blood will this soak up? Yeah. yeah. You know, what's the what's the most danger? You know, we, we never talked about it. Yeah. You know, it yeah. was just like, there's your med kit. You got to carry it. And iodine tablets. Make sure you got those. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. and that was it. And uh, nobody ever asked the why. Are we really preparing our soldiers to deal with trauma on the battlefield? Now, they did eventually. Yeah. I mean, when the war kicked off, obviously, we started really ramping up. Every mm-hmm. person has to be able to treat and do mm-hmm. medical aid for themselves yeah. and their buddies. But um, early on, man, if, mm-hmm. if, you know, 19... 19- 89 we'd have went to a big major ground war uh yeah. you know the the units i was in would have been prepared some mm-hmm. of the higher higher speed units like the ranger regiment and you know the special operations were pro- i'm sure they were way better prepared than we were but um the average grunt wasn't yeah they didn't no. have any idea Mm-mm. they were just gonna lay on the ground and scream medic as loud as they could yeah i remember um and i say this when i teach personal security but i remember shooting even in sephardic and we were still running berettas back then yeah and shooting, and I was a really good shot. Front sight, front sight, front sight, and punching like a t- all my rounds in a tiny little hole. And that was the mark of a man, oh, yeah. right? Yeah, well, was... I look back now, and I'm like, that's stupid. It, number one, if you're putting all your rounds in the same place, you're shooting too slow. Speed up, right? And number two, I want to stitch that guy in as many places as possible yeah. to make sure, because people don't die when they're shot once. you got to bleed all that red stuff yeah. out sometimes, right? Yeah. you got to hit them in multiple places. And then if I'm front sight focused, front sight, front sight, I'm blocking out because I'm focused on the front sight. The back sights are blurred. Target is blurred. I'm, I'm not seeing hostile intent, right? Yeah. I'm looking for his hands and seeing hostile intent. So if I'm focused on that front sight the whole time, yeah. number one's too slow. And number two, I'm not getting a good picture of what that guy is doing, right? Yeah. So we teach you how to shoot with alignment. We shoot you how to, how to shoot very, very effectively, but be able, and I like red dots for that. Red yeah. dots can superimpose on a target. I can still he, see his actions. I can still determine yeah. hostile intent and shoot very accurately. But a lot of things back then, 
Man, it was the mark of a man. If you could oh, put yeah. all your yeah. bullets in a yeah. tiny little hole, it was like, damn, I'm badass, yeah. right? Well, but you, it's too slow. Thing, and the thing is, if you have proper alignment and body position, it, w nobody's ever saying don't use your sights, mm -hmm. but your sights should be running in the background. They're, yeah. If you have proper alignment and body position you and you get that weapon up yeah. and, and put rounds where they need to be, the sights are going to be where they're supposed to. And especially the initial one or two, and then you can transition to the sights? Yeah, then you fight your way. You evolve to your yeah. sights. It's I used not, to shoot IDPA all the time. Me and yeah. Mike Glover shot together, and I would always be... You know, they put the stats out at the end, and I would always be the most accurate, but I'd never win no. because I was drilling down on that front side, and I was just too slow. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it was a lesson learned for me. I, I don't mind looking back and going, I did that wrong. I, yeah. I'm going to evolve now. Well, and this is one of those things where, you know, people come out of, come out of the woodwork and they'll go, oh, they're saying that. Oh, yeah. Use your sights, mm -hmm. and you should just spray rounds. No, yeah. we're not saying that. No. Nope. Like, nope. you know, unlike a lot of the people, we've actually shot people in combat yeah, and, yeah. and understand mm -hmm. the realities of it. and. Understand that I went through a whole CQB eval, probably the highest trained shooting I've, I was in the military. Our, yeah. our final CQB eval, all you do is shoot for weeks on end. Mm -hmm. And if I thought back on that eval, I don't remember seeing my red dot once, but I, all the targets were clean. Yeah. I had all A zone hits. All the targets are clean. So I did that somehow. Yeah, it, it, and, it aligned properly. You yeah. build that muscle memory and you build that alignment you in. You build that firing solution you and do. you know what's right. You do. And you it know. takes a little time, yeah. but it's so much faster yeah. and, and, yeah. and so much... Uh, so much more efficient yeah and, and you, you can know. if you're you're going to be even if you disagree with what i what we just said bottom line is if you're in a hostile engagement close up with pistol mm -hmm. you know there's stats on where them let's just say you're at five yards five feet whatever um when you pull that pistol out you are not going to go right to your sights you're going to be looking at that target you're yeah. going to be you are. i don't care what there's a stat i heard from the fbi is that most gunfights are three runs Three feet and three seconds. Oh, really? Yeah, I heard yeah. That one. Um, it, it's funny because when I when I teach personal security, I'll I'll talk about this, and you know when I do the women's class, they're all they're all they're awesome to teach. But when I do the men's class, I can see some eye rolling, you know. And at the end, when we're done, I say, "Who saw their sights?" Because they went through multiple scenarios. Yeah. Nobody. No. I said, "Who thought I was full of shit when I said you're not yeah. going to see your sights?" Yeah. And they were like, "I really yeah. did think that," and I, I, I was shocking to me because you train front side, front side, front side, yeah. and you're lining up on the range because you're trying to be accurate. And that's great, and there's a place yeah. for that. Yeah, but just is. understand that there's ways to shoot faster and accurate, especially in close range, that um, are, are proven techniques. Yeah. And again, back to the why, like when you, when you're doing your training, you know, my, my opinion is that when you're close up with a pistol gunfight, you're, you are need to be hard target focused. Mm -hmm. I need to be looking at what that person's doing and why they're yeah. doing it and reacting to it. Right. So boom, concealed carry situation. I'm going to draw my pistol and go to work. I need to be figuring out what they're doing so I don't go to jail for the yeah, rest of my life. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then eventually, maybe I move the cover and I can get to my sights and I'm going to use my sights in a more effective manner. That's exactly what we want. But the reality of the situation is what we just said. So why am if I'm going to the range and I'm just putting bullet holes on top of bullet holes and drilling dots for six hours a day, am I really training for what I'm going to encounter, or yeah. am I or am I working it out in a live fire? Mm -hmm. You know, try it. I used to yeah. go to the range every time I go to a pistol range and I don't shoot much anymore. I would shoot six inch dots, yeah. right, or three inch dots, and I would drill down the front sight yep. and I would shoot groups, bum 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 bum, and then I would speed up and speed up and speed up until I was off paper and then dial it back in. I do the same with a sniper rifle. Every time I go to range, I shoot one inch pasties at 100 yards because you can't get away with doing anything wrong yeah, yeah. and you can just stack them all. But if you do that, shoot accurately a little bit and then try to use alignment to yeah. shoot at man-sized targets and you'll be surprised how yeah. accurate you can be. Um, that's just one. Um, let's talk about uh, what you got coming up in January. January we got we're starting everywhere we got pistol carbine uh, everywhere mm -hmm. um, you know we have multiple dates you're gonna have to get on the calendar they're all posted now we're the big thing we're doing now is we're down in Texas at uh, Gritter Outdoors mm -hmm. uh, in New Richland or North Richland Hills Texas that's gonna be a base of operations kind of a home base for us for us in Texas and um, they, I want you to get out there and see it it's a great range facility it's an indoor range facility uh, we have like a huge classroom in there we're gonna, we're gonna have access to and it's a big uh, what did they say uh, when I was down there? They said, imagine if, um, what did they say, North Face and Cabela's had a baby. They'd be Gritter Outdoors. That's what they said. <laughs> I, I think that's right. Yeah. But it's, a, it's, a, it's a very professional organization. It's a super yeah. professional organization. Great range staff, mm -hmm. great merchandise, uh, great uh, retail space. They sell everything from Sitka clothing to skis to 
um, there's, firearms, there's been a firearms change. accessories, silencer, you know, suppressors. Yeah. There's been a change in the firearms industry over the last... I remember going into a gun shop in like Fayetteville yeah. and you have these disgruntled guys that were yeah. in the 82nd and they talk down to you like you're an idiot, you know what I mean? And you're an 18 Bravo Special yeah. Forces Weapons yeah. guy. They're talking to you like, what do you want that gun for or whatever, right? It's completely different now. Oh, yeah. There's there's a uh, like Royal Range in, in, in Nashville. Yeah. Um, there, there's, there's facilities like that. Very professional staff, yeah. very knowledgeable staff. Want to help? Want to yeah. want to facilitate you buying a gun and getting trained properly? Very educational focused, yeah. and I really like that. It's a very yeah. comfortable environment for yeah, people gritter, to go in. Gritter is 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 to me the standard for yeah. that in Texas, and I know there's a lot of places like you know Royal Range mm-hmm. that does it too, and there's a lot of places around the country. But that is, you should go in there and take advantage of these places because yeah. uh, we're going to be training down there a lot. We're going to be doing mm-hmm. seminars. We're going to move all the field craft stuff that we can down there over the next. Uh, mm-hmm. for, well, forever. We're gonna yeah. we're gonna really be in in Dallas and in Texas a lot. Um, so keeping a lookout for that. As soon as it thaws out up north, we're gonna be hitting up north mm-hmm. a lot more. Um, yeah, we're just we got a lot of training that's been going on, and we've improved the courses or not. We've adjusted the courses to kind of meet market demand and to meet what the customer feedback was. Mm-hmm. I listened to the customer feedback. Yeah, uh, that's one of the reasons for the, cha- the name change. I kind of thought that. You know what does gunfighter one versus gunfighter two really mean? If I'm not, a, there's no, there's no quantifiable things there. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I want people to understand. We're going to be posting some course videos where our instructors are going to be on there talking about the course. Yep. Talking about what it is and what it isn't. So I recommend that you get on our website. There's going to be a link on there where you can click watch a video. Mm-hmm. All the equipment's going to be listed on there, and you're going to know the like we talk about. You're going to know the why you're going to that course. If yeah. I'm taking a defensive pistol course, why am I going? Mm-hmm. And it'll give you the reasons why we think you should be going. And if it fits your model, man, come come sign up. Mm-hmm. Don't don't you know wait to get in, you know don't wait to go to the gym until you're in shape. Yeah. If, if you need if you need work on your shooting, just get work on your shooting. Yeah. Go there. Our we're going to be professional. We're going to be courteous. It's a no stress environment. It's a learning environment. Mm-hmm. And I guarantee when you leave the course, you're going to be better prepared than when you showed up, without yeah. a doubt. Yeah, the um, yeah, you, you don't want to be just going to the range and practicing bad habits and, no. and ingraining those bad habits into you. Um, we also have like personal security yep. a, a run in a bunch of places. We have canning and jarring here in North Carolina. We have a lot of medical training going on. We have survival training in January. We're going to focus kind of on cold weather stuff, yep. uh, cold weather med, you know, hypothermia, stuff like that. Um, our, our guys are putting together some some content on generators right now because the yeah. power just went out for the four days yeah, here. And the power goes out here every year. Um, we're, we're trying to to real training for real people. Is yep. John came up with that, and that's what we're trying to focus on here and 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 kind of give you what you need and and provide valuable training. So I hope you come train with us. All right. Um, hey, thanks for listening. If you're still there, until next time. Okay, bye.